Okay, good, uh, good day, good afternoon. Uh, you can you hear me, right? I mean, there's no issue with the audio. <laughs> so I guess uh, this week, next five days, I'll be uh, talking to you about spin glasses and some depends on how much time I'm, I have uh, towards the end, also some related, related systems. Uh, I will be using this uh, projection as well as I'll be writing on the board. So the projection will be on and uh, there are a few things here that uh, it's difficult to uh, write down on the board. So those things will be here on the projection. And uh, uh, any questions, et cetera, that you can ask, I'll try to answer on the board and also clarification of some things that are not discussed very well in the transparencies on the slides that I'm going to show. And uh, as um, <clears throat> Sanjeev just said, I mean, uh, don't know about uh, the background of uh, most of you. Uh, so all of you are, uh, uh, what are we, PhD students? Uh, all of you, no postdocs are there? No. Okay, good. So uh, <clears throat> this uh, course will be, uh, yeah, the, the level of uh, standard PhD courses with some advanced topics. <clears throat> so, uh, We'll be talking about spin glasses. So the first question is why spin glasses? Why spin glasses at this time? Because uh, uh, you know, some of you have looked at literature like you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people were very uh, much uh, you know, interested in spin glasses at, the, at that, uh, those points. And many of the papers that I'll be talking about also go back to uh, 90s, 80s, like that. Uh, at, at this point, I mean, people are still working on spin glasses, but not too many. Uh, this is not because you know everything is understood because uh, the questions that remain are, are too difficult so people basically after trying for many years they have sort of given up uh, but you know so still, some efforts are still going on uh, what makes this topic uh, somewhat uh, you know important or interesting at this point is that as you know all of you know um, Giorgio Padisi got the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on spin glasses and uh, this is his work on spin glasses will be uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the main topic of the lectures that I'm going to give. Uh, so historically, you know, that is important. Uh, not just that, uh, but I'll also try to sort of uh, convince you about is that uh, the, the insights that one gained uh, in that work, trying to understand, you know, uh, what, is, what is actually going on in spin glasses, uh, those insights, those techniques, those methods also have been very useful in uh, uh, trying to understand you know, many other statistical systems. <clears throat> so that is where the related systems uh, come into the picture. And uh, those are being used uh, quite, quite extensively even these days to, for example, understand some problems in machine learning and things like that, uh, or some biological systems and things like that. So it is useful to be uh, aware of, uh, be familiar with uh, the kind of ideas that uh, uh, or kind of techniques that were developed, the kind of ideas that can, came into the picture in the study of spin glasses. Although those, the work, specific work that I'm talking about most of the time uh, is not very recent. It will be like you know, 90s or something like that. So, <clears throat> let's see if it works. Yeah, it does work, but it works. Ah, okay. So basically, uh, how many people have actually heard about spin glasses in, in whatever you have studied in your uh, uh, PhD courses or even MSc courses? Okay, not too many. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> basically, what uh, I'd like to do is to sort of begin with uh, you know the question that is being asked here: uh, What are spin glasses? Uh, I'll give you examples of some systems that people have studied experimentally, and uh, these experimental studies uh, raise some questions. And of course, the theory was developed later on to sort of try to understand what is going on in those systems. Uh, so uh, let's just begin at the beginning. Uh, uh, what are spin glasses? So of course, I mean you are familiar with spins. I mean you know you study magnetism, so you know that. Um, there are many systems where there are uh, localized moments, localized spins, and we are they're associated with the magnetic moments. 
And uh, the magnetic moments, of course, interact with each other through various kinds of interactions. And then that leads to basically the magnetic properties of the system, uh, particularly at low temperatures where uh, this interaction becomes important as compared to thermal energy. Uh, there's various kinds of magnetic systems exhibit various kinds of magnetic order. And uh, you are familiar with, uh, I suppose, uh, at least you know, two kinds of magnetic order that uh, are widely observed. One is basically ferromagnetic order, in which um, uh, in the ordered phase, uh, all these magnetic moments tend to point in the same direction. So there is basically, if you look, look at an average over all the, all the magnetic moments, then the average will be non-zero, and that non-zero value is called the magnetization. And that is sort of the order parameter that distinguishes the low temperature phase uh, ferromagnetic state from the high temperature state, the paramagnetic state. The paramagnetic state, the spins will be pointing in random directions, they will be flipping. And as a result, the average value of the magnetic moment is going to be zero, but below the transition, it will be a non zero value. You also know of anti ferromagnetic ordering, right? I mean, where uh, two spins, uh, which are, let's say, uh, talking about lattice model, where at each lattice side there is some magnetic moment. And uh, in a ferromagnetic case, um, let's just try to illustrate it here. So this, these are things that I'm sure you have seen. At each lattice side, there is a magnetic moment, which I'll, let's say, uh, denote by some arrow here. And uh, if that magnetic moment here and the magnetic moment here, they interact in such a way that they want to be parallel to each other, then we have ferromagnet because then at low temperatures, uh, most of the spins will be parallel to each other and we'll have a non-zero magnetization. But uh, if uh, the interaction is such that uh, these two spins want to point in anti I mean, opposite directions. So the interaction typically is something like, let's say if I call it S1, and if I call it S2, typical interaction is minus some coupling constant, S1 dotted into S2, and this J is positive, then uh, the energy is minimized when S1 and S2 are parallel to each other, and that you have when you have ferromagnetism. So if you have uh, J bigger than zero, we call it ferromagnetic. But uh, if J is uh, negative, then the energy is minimized when the spins are pointing in opposite directions. And then uh, you have uh, some sort of a ground state in which you would like uh, these two spins to be anti-parallel, these two spins to be anti-parallel, and so on. Whether that's possible or not, that depends on the lattice on which the spins are sitting. And in some lattices, which are called bipartite lattices, one has a very nice anti-ferromagnetic ground state, where if you look at any pair of spins, which are nearest neighbors of each other, they will be anti-parallel to each other. So these are the two kinds of uh, <coughs> magnetic ordering that uh, are most common, and uh, you have uh, basically anti-ferromagnetic order when J is <coughs> negative. And there are lots of uh, studies of you know, these phase transitions that take place when you're going from the high temperature uh, disordered phase, which is typically called a paramagnetic state, to a low temperature ordered phase, so, which is a ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, depends on the system that we're looking at. Uh, <coughs> so this is not what we are talking about today. We'll be talking about uh, <coughs> systems where there are spins. So the first uh, spin glasses, of course, they have to have spins. But they are not ferromagnetic, they are not antiferromagnetic, they are some other kind of uh, magnetic order, which I call spin glass. So where does this term glass come from? Uh, glass, uh, typically, you know, you are familiar with uh, window glass and things like that. So in, in, in condensed matter physics, the term glass is used to denote uh, systems where uh, it's not ordered. I mean, uh, typically, you know, when, when one talks about glass, it's structural glass. We're looking at a solid material, you know, uh, window glass or something that your uh, <coughs> container um, is made with. These are solid, but they're different from uh, crystal in the sense that uh, in a crystal, the atoms or molecules which are constituting the crystal, they are uh, ordered in a regular manner. They form a lattice. So if you know the position of one of these things, then from that you can deduce the positions of all the other ones because uh, in a crystalline solid, uh, you have this, uh, constituent atoms or molecules, they're forming a very regular structure. But that doesn't happen in a glass. In a glass, the, although it's a solid for most uh, practical purposes, mechanical properties of a solid, if you look at uh, the actual positions of the constituent atoms or molecules, they will not form a regular lattice. So the analogy with spin systems is that and when you have a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet, 
the spins form regular structures. In a ferromagnet, if I look at uh, on the average, in the ordered phase, all the spins will be pointing more or less in the same direction on the average. In an antiferromagnet, we have this order that we, <clears throat> one is up, the other is down, one is up, next one, and, and so on and so forth. So these are like crystalline solids, where basically you have very ordered a low temperature phase. But uh, in a glass, you don't have that kind of, in, 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 in a solid glass, in a, in a structural glass, you don't have that kind of uh, an ordered state. But it is still a solid. It's still different from the liquid state because you know, it has mechanical properties of a solid. So these are the kind of systems where uh, you certainly have a phase which is different from the trivial phase that you have at high temperatures. But this phase that you have at low temperatures does not have uh, the kind of regular structure that one has uh, in, a, in a crystal. Similarly here, we'll be talking about uh, spin systems. We'll again talk about spin system in the sense that we'll talk about uh, localized spins sitting at some, some sites on a lattice. And uh, <clears throat> there, the interactions will be in such, uh, interactions will be such that uh, the low temperature phase uh, is neither ferromagnetic nor antiferromagnetic. It is some kind of you know, other kind of a phase that comes into the picture. And uh, that, that way, I mean, you know, uh, the fact that it doesn't have the conventional kind of order, uh, that's why it is called a glass. Just like, you know, in a solid context, a solid which doesn't have a crystalline order, that is called a glass. So here also, uh, the spin arrangement is such that in these materials, you don't have the nice uh, sort of uh, ordered kind of arrangement that we have when you have either ferromagnetism or antiferromagnetism. So <clears throat> that's, the, that's sort of the origin of the word spin glass that we are looking at a system of spins which interact with each other. What kind of interactions? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about... Um, uh, uh, in most of these cases here, we're talking about solids and the underlying lattice is still periodic. And there are spins sitting at some lattice sites, not necessarily all lattice sites. So that's where the difference sort of comes into the picture, which will be clearer as we go along. So uh, when we talk about uh, copper manganese or iron gold, uh, the solid that we are looking at is mostly, let's say either copper or iron, and they form a nice lattice. But some of the lattice sites, instead of having a copper, you put manganese. Similarly, in the other case, instead are alloys. So in the other case where uh, you have a gold uh, system, and again, you uh, randomly uh, put some uh, iron on some of these lattice sites. And uh, either copper or gold, they don't contain uh, localized spins. You know, pure gold or pure copper, these are not magnetic materials. But if you have manganese or iron, these are magnetic materials. So the sites which are occupied by this magnetic species, they will carry spins. And uh, uh, they will interact with each other. So the interactions, that's what I'm coming to in a minute. But that is the difference in the sense that, you know, if you had pure uh, manganese, then you have a crystal and you have manganese sites at every, manganese spins at every site. But here, that is not what is happening. You are looking at uh, <coughs> a system, uh, this is a canonical example of spin glasses, where you have uh, alloy, it's mostly copper, maybe 5% manganese, similarly here it's mostly gold, maybe 5-10% uh, iron. And uh, these uh, magnetic species are distributed randomly in the lattice. There's overall basic you know, underlying lattice, and only 5% of this lattice will uh, uh, contain manganese spins, or 10% of the uh, lattice will contain um, iron spins. So the picture is somewhat like this, which is basically what I have drawn here also. Here, so there is an underlying lattice, and uh, most of the lattice sites are empty of spins. No spin is sitting there. But only a small fraction of these lattice sites, which are chosen at random because we are looking at a random alloy, the positions of these sites which are occupied, they don't form a lattice, as you can see here. Those are sort of uh, distributed at random. And only on those sites you have these spins. Okay? So uh, this is different in that sense from a pure uh, copper or pure manganese or whatever, uh, because these systems have what, I, what is known as quenched disorder. So I have to spend some time telling you a little bit about what one means by quenched disorder. So the disorder that I'm talking about here is disorder in the positions of the 
spins. Of course, you know, uh, at high temperatures, the orientations of the spins also will be disordered. That's the usual paramagnetic phase. So we are not talking about that disorder. That disorder is a thermal uh, disorder, which uh, of course uh, can be tuned by changing the temperature and so on and so forth. And uh, in many cases, that thermal disorder goes away as you go to sufficiently low temperatures. The system goes into an ordered state. The disorder that I'm talking about is in the positions of these uh, sites, which are occupied by this magnetic species. And uh, because these positions are random, uh, the interactions between any two, let's say I take a, this and that, or this and that, uh, the interaction, of course, depends on the distance. If I look at two spins, the interactions uh, between those two spins will depend on how far they are from each other. And uh, the uh, sort of interesting thing about these systems is that this interaction is an oscillatory function of the distance. We are looking at localized spins in uh, metal. So there are conduction electrons in the, in the metal. And the conduction electrons mediate some kind of an interaction between the spins. And uh, the interaction itself, this falls off as one over r cubed as you go to long distances. But the interesting thing is that the interaction can be both positive and negative, depending on which distance you are looking at, because there is a cos cosine function here. Now you see that a positive interaction uh, means ferromagnetism, negative interactions with, uh, means antiferromagnetism. So in this system, uh, depending on which pair you are looking at, how far they are from each other, the interaction can be either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. And this mixture of ferro and antiferromagnetism that comes uh, randomly in the sense that you know, the positions of this uh, uh, lattice sites where the spins are sitting, those positions are of course uh, random in a random alloy. So, you know, if you, if you want to, I mean, in many of these studies, uh, one looks at uh, simulations, computer simulations. So, I mean, how do you simulate this? So, you start with the lattice and then uh, go to each, each lattice site, and uh, there is a concentration of this uh, magnetic species. Uh, and then you basically decide on the basis of that concentration randomly whether that site should be occupied or not. And then you go through the lattice, uh, do, do it, then you get a particular realization of the, uh, of the, of the sites which are occupied by this. Uh, by the spins. So uh, this is called Ruderman, Kittel, Kasuya, Yoshida interaction between localized spins. This is a standard thing in uh, solid state physics, which tells you about two magnetic moments which are localized in a background of conduction electrons and uh, the interaction mediated by these conduction electrons. is called the RKKY interaction. And because of this oscillatory form, and this KF is important because this KF is something that, uh, uh, because there are electrons, of course, I mean, since there are electrons, there is a Fermi uh, energy, there is a Fermi momentum, uh, depending on the density of electrons and so on. This KF is basically the wave number, the Fermi wave number. Uh, and uh, so this is the picture. This is the microscopic picture that you have a dilute alloy of a magnetic uh, species in a metal. Uh, and uh, then a uh, certain number of lattice sites will be occupied by spins. Uh, they will be occupied at random. And uh, since the distance between two sites is, of course, a random variable, uh, the interaction can be both positive or, and uh, for a particular pair, of course, it's always, you know, it, it's, it's a positive or negative. I mean, it cannot be both. But, uh, and the positions of this don't change. So once you have made the alloy, the sites at which the uh, <coughs> magnetic uh, spins are sitting, those are chosen once and for all. They don't uh, diffuse or they don't uh, hop from one side to another or whatever. So you basically have a system where there is disorder in the positions of the spins or even equivalently, there is disorder in the coupling constant between spins. Positional disorder translates into a, a, a disorder in this J of R uh, because of this dependence of, of the interaction on the distance. And so you basically have a system in which you have both ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interaction, and these are mixed in some sense in a random way. And uh, this, uh, this word is important. It's, uh, so this is basically, because disorder is clear that it's in the position of the particles or in the, in the values of this G of R. And there is a competition between ferro and antiferromagnetic interactions. And it's quenched basically means that uh, for a given sample, uh, this disorder doesn't change as a function of time. So you have to look at time scales. I mean, whenever you are looking at some problem in physics, you have to look at uh, characteristic time scales. So here, of course, the spins can flip or spins can rotate. If you're talking about classical spins, they can rotate. If you're talking about quantum spins, they can change uh, uh, from one uh, <coughs> state to another. Uh, so these are dynamical variables. 
And there are also disorder associated with this interaction, uh, interaction constants themselves. This interaction constants basically come from uh, uh, this, this dependence. And your Hamiltonian typically, of course, will have something that looks like this. Uh, Hamiltonian of the system will be. <coughs> Here you have power law interaction, so you have to basically sum over all the pairs. So you're looking at, um, this is spin at site i and the spin at site j, and there is this gij. And the gij is a function of, is a function of rij, which is the uh, distance between the two, uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, between the two spins. And this rij is basically the same thing as this r that I'm talking about here. So basically, if I look at the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian itself has, these variables JIJs, which are random variables. And uh, the randomness in this is very different. I mean, you can say that also the spins are random. I mean, at high temperatures, the spins will take any different orientations and so on and so forth. The difference between that randomness and this randomness is that this don't change as a function of time. But once you have fixed uh, a particular sample, fix the positions of the power of the, the spins in that sample, then this position don't change. So uh, <coughs> this interactions, they are constant. Uh, they don't have any dynamics in them. And that is why the disorder is called a quenched disorder, uh, as opposed to there is something else which is called an annealed disorder, where <coughs> the interactions themselves are dynamical variables. Uh, JIGs themselves can change. I mean, in this model, for example, if I allow the spins to uh, allow these sites where the spins are located to diffuse, and that may happen at high temperatures. In high temperatures, you know that in lattice, uh, there is some diffusion that uh, uh, the, the particles can go from one lattice side to a vacancy and, and so on and so forth. But uh, here we'll assume that we are at low, low enough temperatures so that uh, these positions of these spins don't change as a function of time. So this uh, <coughs> Rij itself is different for different pairs, but for a given sample, this Rij's uh, are constant. They don't change as a function of time. Whereas given this uh, interaction constants, of course the spins have their dynamics. The spins can uh, flip, they can rotate and whatnot, depending on the temperature. So <clears throat> that is what uh, one means by a quenched uh, disorder. And uh, this is of course an example of a system with quenched disorder. There are many other magnetic systems where you have quenched disorder, but here we are talking about a specific kind of quenched disorder where uh, the JIJs, the interaction parameters, they can be both positive and negative. They can be ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic. Uh, and uh, these two kinds of uh, interactions are sort of uh, mixed in a random way in a particular sample. But once uh, the positions of the spins are fixed in a given sample, they don't change as a function of time. No, this formula can be derived. I mean, this formula is uh, uh, derived from the fact that, you know, the electrons themselves have spins. So you have conduction electrons. So if you have a localized spins that will affect the spins of the conduction electrons, which happen to be near that particular spin. And that in turn, through the other conduction electrons, will propagate to the other localized spins. And uh, <coughs> this formula is derived in a, in a standard way. This is in three dimensions, yes. Sorry? Uh, the, uh, this, this thing might change. I have to, have to look at it because you know, it, it depends on the properties of the, the, the propagator in some sense, spin propagator of a uh, free electron system. And that does depend on dimension. So, <clears throat> I hope I have, I mean, I'm spending a lot of time on it because it's uh, important to sort of understand the basic structure of the kind of models that I'll be looking at. Uh, I'll be looking at basically spin systems uh, where you have Hamiltonian that sort of looks like this, uh, SI dot SJ, or you can look at the Ising version of this Hamiltonian where each spin can have only plus, or plus one or minus one. But the important thing is that the coupling constants are uh, random and not just random, uh, they can be both positive and negative. So, I mean, just to give you another example of a random system where that doesn't happen, is that, I mean, you know, you can have, uh, again, you know, an alloy, 
but the alloy, the, the original system is, uh, let's say, ferromagnetic. So at every site, you have um, uh, a spin and the interaction between nearest neighbor sites is ferromagnetic. But you dilute this by a non-magnetic species. So some sites, you take away the spin and put some vacancy there. So there, uh, if you have such a system that, uh, you know, here you have a spin, but here you have a vacancy, here you have a vacancy, here you have another spin, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so the interaction is there when the two spins are there, but there is no interaction there. There is no interaction here. So again, that's a random system, but the interaction is zero or positive. The uh, nearest neighbors, if the, one of the neighbors is not there, and there's no interaction. So it's, it's, it's basically, uh, uh, but when they're there, it's, it's positive. So there is no mixture of ferro and empty ferro. It's just a dilute ferromagnetic system. And uh, that kind of uh, disorder, that's also a coincidence disorder because we are looking at basically a sort of vacancies which are fixed uh, in a given sample, doesn't change as a function of time. But uh, that kind of interaction does not lead to what we call spin glasses because there is no competition. There is no uh, competition between ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic ordering. <clears throat> So this is the kind of systems that we'll be looking at. There are many other examples of spin glasses, but uh, you know, one doesn't have to really uh, worry about you know, all of them because in some sense, the physics is pretty much similar uh, irrespective of which particular spin glass you are looking at. The basic ingredients are this quench disorder, disorder that doesn't change as a function of time, and this competition between ferro and antiferromagnetic interactions. So that you have a mixture of, you cannot have either ferromagnetic order or antiferromagnetic order. If there is some kind of an order, it has to be something which is different from both either ferromagnetism or antiferromagnetism. Now the question is um, uh, why people are interested. I mean, you know, uh, one can say that you know here you have both ferro and antiferro system doesn't know what to do, so there is no kind of magnetic order. That also is a possibility. So what uh, people. Uh, uh, what made people interested in this, that there are some experiments. Time lag. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, most condensed matter physics um, uh, systems, uh, uh, the experiments basically tell the uh, theories that there is some, something interesting going on, and so, and then they got in, uh, involved in trying to understand what is going on. So this, as you see, this is not very recent, 86. <laughs> the first uh, experiment was done is uh, 86 by uh, Maidosh and uh, collaborators. And the basic idea is that uh, you measure, I mean, you know, to look at magnetic order, you look at magnetic susceptibility, how the magnetization changes as a function of magnetic field derivative of magnetization with respect to the magnetic field and susceptibility. And susceptibility they measured as a function of uh, 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 temperature. And what they found was that uh, you have this usual behavior. In a paramagnet, how is this supposed to go as a function of temperature? In paramagnet susceptibility, do you know how, uh, what is the temperature dependence? One by two, it's Curie law, right? <clears throat> so, uh, this is something like that, pretty much like a Curie law. But then uh, they found that below a certain temperature, uh, it doesn't follow like a Curie law, and instead there is some kind of a cusp, and it comes down again. And that suggests that there is some kind of a phase transition taking place at that temperature. Now, of course, I mean, you know, there are ways of measuring uh, whether it's a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet. One can do spontaneous magnetization, one can do neutral scattering and things like that to look at the kind of magnetic ordering that is taking place in a given system. So nothing like that happened there. So there is no conventional magnetic ordering below this transition, but uh, there is a characteristic temperature at which there is a total deviation from the high temperature Curie law behavior and one sees a cusp. So uh, the susceptibility as a function of temperature and this cusp still, uh, suggested that there might be something interesting going on there. Now, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, of course, I mean, you know, there are, there are, uh, when one does experiments, there are many things that one has to take care of. So what these people did is this, this is actually AC susceptibility. So there is a frequency associated with this measurement. It's a low frequency, but there's a frequency. And what they found is that the behavior near this cusp actually depends on frequency. 
that it is going to lower temperatures as you go to lower frequencies and the height also is changing. It's, it's changing by small amount, but it is changing. So there was some controversy about you know, whether this actually is a phase transition or it's just a dynamical effect, et cetera, et cetera. But they went to lower and lower frequencies and they could find that you know, it asymptotes to a finite temperature at which this cause occurs. So this uh, was pretty good evidence that something interesting is going on here. So <clears throat> this is uh, one important uh, property that one has to uh, eventually understand. <clears throat> The other property that made people very much interested in these things is that uh, <clears throat> these materials uh, exhibit very slow dynamics at temperatures near that cusp or uh, uh, lower than that. So uh, in the low temperature, if you assume that there is a transition going on at that temperature, then there is a low temperature phase. And one found that the system becomes very, very slow uh, near that phase transition. And this is another thing that is sort of uh, characteristic of glassy systems. What I told you about is that a glassy system doesn't have a conventional kind of order, but uh, another characteristic property of glassy systems is that the dynamics becomes very, very slow. That's why these things are called spin glass because the dynamical degrees of freedom are spins, <coughs> but it shares the property of other glasses in that, that you have a disordered uh, low temperature phase, which doesn't have any conventional kind of uh, magnetic order, and the dynamics uh, becomes very slow as one approaches that, that phase. So what is being done here? This is something that is interesting. <clears throat> so uh, earlier I told you about the susceptibility. And uh, susceptibility was measured. I mean, so this, this is the, this is the curves. I mean, these, are, these two are for two different samples. These two are the curves that correspond to the previous picture, where you cool the system and then apply a field, uh, is a field, and then you measure the magnetization. <clears throat> and then you, know, you, can, you can do that uh, increasing temperature and so on and so forth. That's called zero field cooled uh, magnetization, or you can apply the field at high temperatures and cool the system in that field. And that is called a field cooled. So these are two different protocols. In one case, you're cooling the system to a low temperature and then apply a, apply a field. Other case, you are uh, cooling the system in a field and then going to lower temperatures. In both cases, you go to the same temperature and same magnetic field. So it's the same point in the thermodynamic space, but you see the susceptibility is different. So the only way that one can sort of understand that is that the dynamics has become very slow. And so uh, whether one does it this way or that way, that matters, history matters. That the, uh, when you prepare a system at a particular T and a particular H, then the, in this system for T less than TC, it matters how you get to that particular point in TH, whether you cool it in a field or you cool first and then apply a field. And these two, uh, at least, you know, experimental time scales give you different values. It's on the, it's, um, the measured susceptibility is zero field susceptibility. Yeah. But, uh, so even if you cool it in a field, then you switch off the field and measure this or whatever. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, M versus H. So M divided by H basically. And so you cool it in a field yeah. and a small field. In a small it will, field. It will okay. give you some magnetization at low temperatures. And you just plot that magnetization as a function of h, and the slope at the origin will give you the zero field susceptibility. Okay, so even if it's in a cooled in a field, the field is itself small. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. So that's one thing, and then you cool in zero field, and then apply a field, and then measure the magnetization. Then we'll get a different magnetization, and uh, that will give you a different lower susceptibility. Yeah, so the dynamics is coming in here in the sense that, you know, when you change some thermodynamic parameter, let's say you go from a high temperature to a low temperature, then the system has to sort of adjust, reach equilibrium at that low temperature, right? And the dynamics determines how fast or how slow the system reaches equilibrium at that lower temperature, right? So, I mean, if, the, if you allow the system to reach equilibrium, then the history doesn't matter. How you got to that particular point in thermodynamic space doesn't matter. But uh, if uh, the system takes a uh, very long time to reach equilibrium for the new values of the parameters, then you know, things will depend on how you get to that particular point. Uh, so here in this, in this after uh, TF, below TF mm -hmm. temperature, uh, it's in equilibrium system. It, uh, yeah, so I mean, the idea is that, you know, uh, 
system would eventually reach equilibrium, but it takes much longer than the time scales available in the laboratory to reach equilibrium. What would happen is that, let's say, I mean, if, if I do this experiment, that I cool in uh, zero field and then apply a field, you will get uh, some magnetization. But then, you know, you keep the field constant at that value and then, uh, you know, do the measurement uh, one day later, you will see a slightly higher magnetization. So eventually, as a function of time, this line is supposed to reach that line as you wait for longer and longer time scales. But uh, this uh, process is very, very slow. Okay, so the upper curve is equilibrium curve. That's, uh, that's the understanding, that upper curve is the equilibrium and the lower curve is, uh, uh, has not reached equilibrium at that temperature and magnetic field. But if you wait for long enough, there are things like aging and stuff like that. I'm not going into details, the dynamics is very important. But as you make a change in some parameter, the system takes a very, very long time to reach equilibrium at that new you know, set of parameters. And this could be, uh, the way it approaches could be a power law, could be stress exponential, there are all kinds of, but this is a slow process, slow process in all glasses. So that's why it makes it a glass. <clears throat> See, the magnetic field is small. It's just a 5.9 force state or something like that. <clears throat> so, but you know, uh, above TC, it doesn't matter in the sense that above TC, the system can reach equilibrium over experimental time scales. So it doesn't matter whether you uh, first uh, cool and then apply the field or you cool in a field, it give you the same result. But something happens at this uh, temperature, which uh, sort of corresponds to the cusp in the susceptibility, such that at temperatures uh, around here or below, uh, the value that you get for some thermodynamic quantity like the susceptibility that depends on uh, history that depends on how did you how you prepare the system in that particular thermodynamic state <clears throat> so these are uh, basically the standard features of a glass that uh, you have a disordered uh, structure at low temperatures in the low, te low temperature phase it does not have conventional large and long range order and uh, concomitantly uh, in the low temperature phase, you also have very slow relaxation. That uh, system takes a very long time to reach equilibrium. Or if you can also look at system is equilibrium, but you're looking at uh, two time uh, correlations. And those correlations will decay very, very slowly. Hmm? So A and B are the two different protocols. Right? One is here. Uh, one is cooling in a field and then uh, measuring the magnetization. B is uh, here, where you first cool and then apply a magnetic field and then measure the magnetization. Ah. B curve will approach A, yes. That is experimental fact. No, 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 this is the equilibrium. The field cooled is supposed to be the equilibrium. Why is that is basically uh, in the sense that it will be, become clear later on. Uh, <clears throat> the low temperature phase of this system is such that there are many, many metastable states and so on and so forth. So the idea is that if we apply the field at high temperatures, where there are not many metastable states, but then as you pull the system in the presence of the field, that allows the system to sort of uh, find the correct one that would, that would be appropriate for that particular field. Okay, so uh, this, this is the, these are the basics. So I mean, I'm spending a lot of time on it because just to give you some idea about what kind of systems uh, one is looking at here. Uh, this kind of uh, this kind of large difference, depending on the history, should not be seen in a ferromagnetic system. There is also some long time scales. The ferromagnetic system is this idea of uh, in a ferromagnetic system, you don't have all the spins pointing up because the system breaks up into domains and things like that. So that also requires some annealing and stuff like that. And also, uh, if you have a continuous phase transition near the phase transition, characteristic time scales diverge. There's something called critical slowing down. So within a ferromagnet, if you're looking at uh, the transition from the high temperature paramagnetic phase to the low temperature paramagnetic phase, near the phase transition, there will be slow dynamics. So, the, so the, those are there also, but not this kind that you know, 
uh, things take uh, days or months or whatever to go from the metastable value to the stable value, things like that. Yeah. That happens in a ferromagnet because in a ferromagnet, if you cool the system from high temperatures to the low temperature, then if there is no magnetic field present, system will go into domains. You will not get a spontaneous magnetization. But if you cool in a field, that will align the domains and that allows you to get a spontaneous magnetization. So, you know, there are subtleties there also. But here, uh, one is talking about a change of uh, order of magnitude that dynamics is becoming extremely slow. Other questions? Yes. This uh, this also not this also has a not a not a cusp, but there is a break. Up to this point, it is going as one over t, and then it's becoming constant. So there is a change in slope. Here the slope goes from uh, whatever one sign to the other sign. Here the slope is uh, like this, but then after that it goes to zero. But there is still a discontinuity in the slope, and the temperature at which this occurs is the same, irrespective of whether you are doing it this way or doing it that way. Okay, so th these are the experimental facts. And then uh, sort of people try to sort of understand what is going on in these systems. And there are many other experiments uh, that people did at that time, uh, neutron scattering, then muon spin resonance and uh, MOS bar, all sorts of things, which all of them tell us, uh, all of these experiments told us that the spins are not ordered in a very regular manner in low temperatures, uh, but uh, there is some kind of a freezing. And uh, what one means by freezing is something that I'll come to in a minute. <clears throat> and uh, slow dynamics, again, people have studied in many different ways. <clears throat> so this, uh, when people sort of thought about these things, this one thing that uh, uh, played an important role in their thinking is what is known as frustration. And frustration basically means that the system is called frustrated if all the pair interactions cannot be satisfied simultaneously. What, what is not no, satisfied? So uh, there is, of course, you know, a pair interaction like that, some coupling constant times S1 dot S2. And if S1 and S2 can take position or take orientations which minimize this energy, then that particular bond is satisfied. So uh, <coughs> If all interactions cannot be satisfied, that basically means that you cannot minimize all the pair interactions simultaneously by any choice of the orientations of the spins. So uh, here I've just given you some examples. Uh, here there is no disorder. It's a standard example of a frustrated system, which is an antiferromagnet on a triangular lattice. Has anybody seen this example earlier? Or this is one of the sort of very uh, sort of common models that people had looked at again many years ago. No? <clears throat> yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, so the, what, what one is saying here is that all three interactions are antiferromagnetic. So if I want to satisfy this interaction, then the spins uh, at the two ends, three and two have to be anti-parallel to each other, right? So this is, let's say one case, these two are anti-parallel to each other. If I want to satisfy this interaction, then again, they have to be anti-parallel. So if one is down, this is up, then this has to be down. But then these two are, oh, sorry. This, this is not anti-parallel, these two are parallel. So uh, when you have a dashed line, that basically means that they are parallel, parallel. So you start with this, this is down. So if you want to satisfy this bond, then this has to be up. Again, if you want to satisfy this bond, then this has to be, this is up, so this has to be down. But then these two are parallel, so that means that that bond is not satisfied. So you cannot make uh, you know, any any arrangement of the spins uh, in which case, for which all these bonds for all all, the, all of these bonds you have the minimum possible energy. And here it happens because of the lattice. 
here all the interactions are negative so there's no disorder no quench disorder here but all the interactions are uh, antiferromagnetic and the lattice is such that uh, lattice makes the problem frustrating but you can have other systems uh, where uh, uh, <coughs> this jijs themselves are random right this example that i gave here that this jijs they depend on the distance between the two uh, points i and j and if that uh, depending on the distance it can be positive or neg uh, negative so there could be situations where the j's themselves uh, can be positive or negative and here uh, again you know, this is something that you just uh, work, work it out yourself the idea is that if the product of the signs of the four j's is positive then there is no frustration if the product of the signs is negative then uh, the corresponding plaquet is frustrated in the sense that you cannot satisfy all the bond interactions example is here plus j plus j minus j plus j here uh, three positive and one negative and then you just construct this uh, kind of a way of finding some kind of a ground state you start with some uh, <coughs> spin which is let's say pointing up then plus j basically means this should be up this should be up similarly this also should be up but then this 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 bond will not be satisfied <coughs> so i mean you know uh, depending on uh, if you have a situation where the interactions pair interactions themselves can take positive and negative values then uh, for certain arrangement of this uh, positive and negative values uh, you will find that uh, you get a, uh, a plaquette i mean here it's a square lattice but i mean in this problem for example if you have this uh, these are the sites where <laughs> you are looking at copper manganese and this is <clears throat> manganese one And then there could be another one, which is manganese three. <clears throat> and you know, then interactions depends on all these distances. And uh, since it's a uh, oscillatory function of the distance, it is quite possible that you know you can have, let's say, a positive interaction here, a positive interaction here, negative interaction there. And then these three spins. If you just consider this three, three spins, then you will not be able to satisfy all pair interactions because you know easier to see with uh, uh, Ising spins. So if this is up, this also wants to be up. This also wants to be up, but then this interaction uh, uh, is connecting two spins, uh, which are uh, <coughs> should be opposite to satisfy that interaction. So this kind of triplets and multiple multiplets, et cetera, et cetera, all, all, all these things uh, will be possible when the positions of this manganese spins are, are sitting at random. So this is basically what uh, is known as frustration. And this is something which is satisfied by this kind of models that you have a system where uh, interactions can be uh, positive or negative. Uh, and, uh, you know, then there will be situations where you will not be able to satisfy uh, all the interactions simultaneously and then uh, we'll call that uh, uh, system frustrated yeah these distances are also random so yeah yeah so the magnitudes will not be the same that's a good point actually here uh, the magnitude of of, of j let's say one two and you have j one three and j this strength in general will not be the same and so it is possible to still find let's say unique ground state the point is you keep the interaction which is the, the lowest magnitude you make that frustrated whereas the uh, interactions that are large those you uh, don't make frustrated so that will give you still a low energy but uh, still the point is you know uh, all interactions are not satisfied so the it doesn't necessarily mean i mean here in this case there are uh, uh, infinitely many ground states the triangular lattice uh, antiferromagnet there is a, a extensive degeneracy of the ground state but uh, here this kind of a systems that in general will not happen that uh, at least for the triplet for example i mean uh, one can find out which is the lowest energy state, depending on the magnitudes and the signs of these interactions. But still, you know, there are, uh, because of this fact that, you know, uh, there are some bonds which are unsatisfied, uh, it's possible to have uh, 
excited states which are close to the ground state. In other words, uh, uh, in general, uh, frustration leads to, uh, shouldn't be called ground states, I mean, near ground states. The energies are not exactly the same, but uh, similar energies are possible. <clears throat> so this is uh, actually very, very important. And we'll see that uh, uh, this multiplicity of, uh, of uh, low-lying states, I shouldn't say ground states, I'll say low-lying, low-energy states, this actually plays a very important role in understanding the uh, properties of the system. And in particular, this long time scales that I had mentioned, that one can uh, sort of uh, relate to the presence of this uh, uh, multiplicity of uh, what we call metastable states, multiplicity of low-lying uh, minima of the energy. In the sense that you know system may get stuck into one of this minima and then if you want the system wants to explore a more of phase space it has to get out of this minimum and go to the next one and so on and to do that uh, some energy barrier has to be overcome so i mean typically the picture is something like this that uh, if you have i mean this is very rough picture that uh, here we are plotting from the energy and here is some spin configuration i mean you know some some coordinate <laughs> and uh, the energy has uh, uh, <clears throat> this might be the true ground state but there are this minima which are sort of little different from the ground state and if you pull the system and it gets trapped into one of this minima then to go from here to there it has to overcome this barrier and this barrier activation of course is very slow at low temperatures so that is what gives rise to uh, slow dynamics. This is a very crude or rough picture, but this kind of a picture, landscape picture is uh, very common in all glasses systems, not just spin glasses. In spin glasses, we'll see that some theories actually can take into account this kind of a structure uh, explicitly, whereas in some other, many other systems, such a theory is still lacking. Okay, so everybody understands what frustration means and its effects. Let's see what do I have next. Hmm. So now we have the basic ingredients to start sort of formulating some kind of a theory of uh, a spin glass, uh, which is uh, uh, <clears throat> what is happening at this temperature where you have this cusp and uh, how is this low temperature phase different from the high temperature phase. <clears throat> and uh, Again, you know, this is how much, 45 years ago, even more than that. This is sort of the time when I was a, a graduate student, <laughs> a long time ago. <clears throat> so, yeah, so this ingredients I told you about already that uh, you have to have a random mixture of ferro and anti uh, interactions, but uh, this coupling constants can be both positive and negative but they don't change as a function of time. For a given system, they're fixed in time, uh, but then, you know, the spins themselves are, of course, the dynamical variables. Uh, and uh, then basically, uh, these, these are the basic ingredients. I mean, in the copper manganese, et cetera, et cetera, they're, uh, what I just told you, all these things are there. But this Edwardson Anderson basically made this problem simple uh, by saying, simpler than copper manganese, by saying that you have the spin sitting on a lattice but the interactions are made random by hand, right? So, I mean, then you don't have to worry about, you know, exactly what the spins are and, and stuff like that. The spins are sitting on a lattice and to make it even simpler, one makes the spins Ising spins. So these are plus minus one variables. And uh, they are sitting on a lattice and you say that the only nearest neighbor spins interact. So this, this brackets basically means only nearest neighbor spins. Uh, and these JIJs uh, are constant in time, but, they are random in the sense that they came from a probability distribution. So I don't know exactly, I mean, in general, I mean, if you're given a sample of a spin glass, copper manganese, you don't know exactly what the spins are sitting. Similarly here also, I would not specify this JIJs uh, for each pair IJ. I would say that uh, for each JIJ is drawn from a distribution. And the distribution is a product measure in the sense that uh, there is no correlation between a JIJ one pair and the JIJ correspond to some other pair. So they're all independent random variables and they're taken from a distribution 
Of course, when they, after that, they're taken from a distribution, they don't change further as a function of time. So there are many samples. For, just like, you know, other case I was telling you that, that you know, when you have a lattice and then you decide which site is occupied and which site is not occupied. Uh, again, you know, once you have done that, then you have, have a particular realization. But then if you do it again, using a different random number generator, then you will generate a new realization. But once the realization has been found, then the variables, these GIG variables, they are constant for that particular sample, particular realization. And then you want to find out uh, uh, how these sigmas uh, adjust to some extent to these uh, interactions and what kind of thermodynamic states they, they get. So uh, again, you know, this is a simplified form where I'm saying is that each GIJ is an independent random variable and it is taken from a distribution. And this distribution, again, for simplicity, I'm not saying that uh, this has to be so, but uh, just to uh, sort of understand what happens in a spin glass, what one says is that this distribution is such that its average value is equal to zero. So it's neither uh, ferromagnetic nor antiferromagnetic on the average. Uh, and it is taken either from a Gaussian distribution or you can take a discrete form uh, value saying that the GIJ can be either plus J or minus J with, with equal, equal probability. So this is the important thing that um, average value, when I draw this bracket and write AV, that basically means taking an average with respect to this probability distribution. So here, of course, is symmetric around uh, j equals zero. So it's average value equal to zero and uh, second moment is basically j squared. So these are the two things that are important. These are the two things that this says that there is no tendency to ferromagnetism or anti-ferromagnetism uh, on the average, equal number of ferro and anti-ferromagnetic systems. And uh, this basically means that uh, uh, this j will set the scale of energy. So if you look at KBT, for example, and any temperature which is important should be of order J. Okay, so this is a, a model which basically is trying to incorporate the sort of physics that I have been discussing here. That you have a system with a, a random JIJs and these JIJs can be positive or negative. And here we are saying that they're positive or negative with equal probability so that there's average value equal to zero. And uh, then J squared average, basically that sets the scale of energy and the scale of temperature. And in general, this kind of models, depending on a particular realization, you will typically have uh, just uh, what I was telling you here, that if I look at a plaquette, then uh, uh, maybe this is uh, <coughs> positive, uh, this is positive, this is positive, but this is negative. So, I mean, this plaquette will be frustrated and that would lead to, in some sense, a multiplicity of ground states and one expects to have some kind of a non-trivial uh, kind of dynamics at low temperatures. First of all, of course, one has to understand whether there is a, a non-trivial statics in the sense that whether this model shows any phase transition or not. I mean, the obvious thing uh, would be to sort of assume that since it's a, a mixture of ferro and antiferro, it doesn't know which direction to order. And so it will remain disordered all the way down to T equals zero. But uh, what experiments show and what uh, subsequent theoretical work has shown is that there is a possibility of a phase transition. But uh, then the phase transition, one is to understand what kind of phase, what is happening in the, uh, the, uh, in the low temperature phase. And that is what uh, these people first started out to uh, tell us. So this is now the uh, basic physics. <clears throat> what these people actually, uh, again, given this uh, sort of um, experimental uh, results that were available, uh, these people sort of tried to uh, put forward this idea of a new kind of ordering. And this new kind of ordering is uh, very different from uh, the conventional uh, kind of magnetic ordering that you have in uh, ferro or antiferromagnets in the following sense. <clears throat> so now, I mean, again, you know, you have to keep track of two kinds of averaging. One is this uh, square bracket with a uh, uh, subscript AV, which is making averaging over the distribution of this GIJs. And another is this, these brackets. These are the thermal averages. So for a given J, set of GIJs, we have a Hamiltonian. And then that I mean, you know, uh, gives you some kind of a Boltzmann distribution and different spin configurations uh, will occur with uh, the probabilities which are consistent with that Boltzmann distribution. So the standard way of doing thermodynamics 
statistical mechanics actually, uh, can be done here, assuming that the system reaches equilibrium and all that. So you can always uh, do this thermal averaging. And that thermal averaging is given by this, this brackets. <clears throat> so everybody knows what this high temperature paramagnetic phase is. There is no magnetic ordering. And then uh, the average value of each uh, spin uh, is equal to zero. Magnetization obviously is equal to zero. And susceptibility follows this Curie law, one over T law, et cetera, et cetera. That's a trivial high temperature phase that is not of much interest. <clears throat> but then uh, what these people predicted or suggested was that you now have a new low temperature spin glass phase where individual spin averages are not equal to zero. But the magnetization is zero because some of the spin averages are positive, some of the spin averages are negative. Okay, so there is a big difference between here and there. Here, the spin average itself is equal to zero, but in the spin glass phase, the spin averages are not equal to zero. But since because of this, you know, ferro anti ferro mixture and all this, all the disorder, randomness, and all those quantities, different spins will be frozen in different directions. For some spins, the sigma average will be positive, some other spins, sigma average will be negative. And since there is no preference for either ferro or anti ferro magnetism, uh, one would have the magnetization, which is now uh, averaged over the whole system. That would be equal to zero. So, of course, I mean, a spin glass doesn't show any kind of uh, uh, magnetization at low temperatures. That's people measuring experiments. It's not a ferromagnet. So, M has to be equal to zero. But then, how do you distinguish that state from the high temperature phase, where also M is equal to zero? So, M cannot be an order parameter. M is zero at the high temperature phase because individual spin averages are equal to zero. And M is zero in the low temperature phase because individual spin averages are not zero, but they can be positive and negative with equal probability. As I go from one side to another side to another side, some cases I'll see a positive value of uh, sigma average. Some other cases we'll see a negative value of sigma average. And on the average, this will be equal to zero. No, at this point, I mean, there is no average over J. So that will come later on when we do the theory. In experiments, you don't average over J. Experiments, you have a sample where uh, the positions of the magnetic species are fixed, right? And some of them will be, uh, some pairs will give you positive, some pairs will give you negative and all that. But those are fixed. So we are not doing an average over J's actual experiment. But then, you know, when you do theory, then it might be, convenient to do some kind of an average of a j which is something that will come later on but this is just for a given sample and sample large sample in the large n limit if the n is not very large then this cancellation will not happen <clears throat> so only when n is large uh, then uh, we'll find that uh, on the average on the average meaning that averaging over the whole system <clears throat> this m will be this will be something i mean when you divide by n so if you sum over all the, all the sigmas, this will not be zero. This will be something which is, let's say, square root of n or something like that. Divide by n, then let n go to infinity, then that will be zero. <coughs> <coughs> so how do we distinguish that from this? I mean, you know, we are, we are uh, theory of phase transitions tell us that uh, whenever you have uh, phase transition, then you have to define some kind of an order parameter such that the order parameter is zero in the high temperature phase and it becomes non-zero in the low temperature phase. So here, uh, the conventional magnetization is certainly not an order parameter that is appropriate for this. But these people suggested, and this is uh, something which is, of course, uh, you know, in, in retro retrospect quite obvious, but uh, this kind of order parameter was not thought of before. So uh, these people, Edwards and Anderson, uh, this Anderson is uh, P.W. Anderson, he is famous, uh, Nobel laureate and all that. And the Edwards is also a famous physicist, didn't get Nobel Prize, but uh, Sam Edwards, uh, who is very uh, well known for his work on uh, polymers and uh, uh, <coughs> soft matter systems. <coughs> so, so this order parameter they, they invented, so to speak, we just, just say that, you know, instead of summing over the sigma averages, you sum some over sigma average squared. So this will distinguish between the high temperature and the low temperature, because here, uh, sigma i averages are non-zero. And here they go, went to zero because you're just summing over some positive and some negative numbers. But here, uh, if you square them, of course, then this will give you non-zero. 
as long as the sigma i thermal averages are non-zero, this Q will be non-zero. And so <clears throat> the distinction between the high temperature and low temperature phase is such that uh, uh, in both cases, you have M equal to zero, but uh, in the high temperature phase, you have sigma I average is equal to zero. Low temperature phase, you have sigma I average non-zero. And so if you square and then take an average, then you'll get something which is non-zero, which will say that uh, we are in a new phase. Q is equal to zero at high temperatures and Q is not equal to zero at low temperatures. So they said that this is the right way of uh, distinguishing between the two phases and uh, to characterize the low temperature phase in terms of an order parameter, which will be non-zero. Another way of looking at it is this, <clears throat> that here we are, one can look at the autocorrelation function of the spin. Again, this is something that uh, you may have seen in your statistical mechanics course that when you have a fluctuating quantity, uh, then uh, <coughs> the time scale associated with this fluctuation uh, can be determined by looking at its autocorrelation function. That how the value of uh, a particular spin at time zero is correlated with the value of the same spin at a later time t. Right. So if these two things are correlated, uh, then you say that you know <coughs> if this average is non-zero, then you say that you know the spin remembers its its its, its orientation over a long period of time. <clears throat> and when this t goes to infinity, this uh, uh, average of the product becomes the same as the product of the two averages. At uh, in, t goes to infinity, then uh, the two spins uh, will be uncorrelated, and so this correlator will basically become the product of the two averages. So if I uh, take the t going to infinity limit, then sigma i, this product average becomes a sigma i average, sigma i average, sigma i average squared, and that gives me the Q, the Edward Sanderson order parameter. So the Edward Sanderson order parameter can be thought of either this way or that way. These are essentially the same thing. Here we are looking at uh, uh, it from the sort of temporal point of view that uh, <clears throat> if I look at this uh, autocorrelation function in the High temperature phase, this will go to zero, but in the low temperature phase, this will go to a non zero value. And uh, that's the same thing as this Edward Sanderson order parameter, which is uh, the uh, <coughs> average value of the square of the spin averages. Okay. But, uh, John, John, so if I mean, experimentally, of course, directly it seems difficult to measure this Q, but maybe this way you can. Is that? So experimentally, there are some experiments which measured the time correlation function in the sense that you know, there's some uh, mu one, not mu one, some uh, something which is local probe of a spin, okay. uh, which basically looks at the dynamics of a particular spin in a copper manganese. And uh, other thing is that, uh, as we'll see, uh, this can be related to the, to the susceptibility. Oh, is it the usual susceptibility? Yeah. Okay. So this cost spin the susceptibility that uh, it can be interpreted. That's so one of the reasons why this way of uh, defining the order parameter was, was uh, useful. That uh, when you say that it's going from a phase where this Q is equal to zero to a phase where this Q is non-zero, that would show a change in the slope of the susceptibility. <clears throat> and uh, this dynamics, uh, I, I forget about uh, this more, not most power, something that probes the spins locally, night shift or some such thing like uh, where uh, one can uh, one can look at whether this autocorrelation function goes to a non-zero value or <laughs> from the theoretical point of view, this is how now uh, this is a proposal at this point. I mean, you know, there is nothing that says that you know, this is the right way of looking at things. So whenever you do a theory, you uh, uh, make a proposal and then you know people will test that proposal by doing other experiments and then they will decide whether the theory is correct or not. So that's what that's the way things followed well, from the experiments they Edwards and Anderson said that this might be a good way of looking at the system. And uh, <clears throat> so the difference between this high temperature and the low temperature phase is that the spin averages spins are getting frozen so high temperature uh, the spins are dynamic so they average to zero over time. Whereas in the low temperature phase, the spins are frozen, but they're frozen in different directions. Different spins are frozen in different directions. So then on the net magnetization is still zero, but this order parameter will be non-zero. <clears throat> uh, 
Huh. <clears throat> so now, though, of course, I mean, you know, this is fine, uh, nice proposal. But I mean, then, the, then the question is, I mean, you know, then one has to do a calculation that shows that uh, this kind of a phase transition actually is possible. That you're know, looking at a disordered system, and uh, there uh, we have tried to define a new kind of phase where this Q is not equal to zero. The question is, uh, uh, can you do a calculation? That shows that there will be a phase transition for this system and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now here, the <coughs> issue is that how you are going to deal with this disorder. So this is a question that came up later on that in a sense that you know, whether you average over these JIJs and, uh, or not. And uh, in a given experiment, in a given sample, the JIJs or you know, whatever the random variables are in the Hamiltonian, those are fixed. They don't change as a function of time. But then doing a theory is very different, uh, very difficult, because now let's say I, I, this is my generic model. I have given uh, this JIJs. JIJs are, uh, I mean, you know, the standard model, Heisenberg model, and things like that. These JIJs are all the same, depending on your nearest neighbor. All the JIJs are the same, so there is no disorder in the in the in the couplings. But now uh, these JIJs will depend on this RIJ and they will uh, take some positive value, some negative value, et cetera, et cetera. But once the positions of the spins are fixed, this JIJ is also fixed. So now, of course, I mean, if you want to do standard uh, statistical mechanics, uh, Then you have to define some kind of a partition function. <coughs> Etc. And you know that there is a well defined uh, framework that uh, you know, calculate partition function, take the log of that, that will give you the free energy, take derivatives with respect to temperature, magnetic field, etc. Cetera, et cetera. <coughs> But then how do you do that? Because you know, uh, these JIJs are not uh, constants. They're all uh, different for different pairs. And what is worse is that you don't even know which pair has what JIJ. You cannot go inside the system and say that the spin number one and spin number two has this, this interaction, uh, three and five have this interaction and so on and so on. But still, you know, there should be some way of uh, uh, deriving some kind of a statistical mechanics or, Things equivalent to free energy, et cetera, et cetera, for such a system. Because uh, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, one assumes that different samples are statistically uh, similar. In the sense that since you know you have a large number of JIGs that they're all taken from the same distribution. So the JIGs for one sample and JIGs for some other sample, they will not be one-to-one -one correspondence. But there will be some kind of a self-averaging, so that one says that macroscopic properties like free energies or magnetization and things like that, they don't change from one sample to another. Of course, there is a way of experimentally testing that also. I mean, you take one sample of copper manganese, take another sample of copper manganese, and one expects that they will give you the same result. Otherwise, you know, nobody will publish those papers. So, <clears throat> so self-averaging is there. I mean, in the macroscopic system, mag uh, macroscopic thermodynamic properties don't depend on the precise location of the magnetic species as long as they're prepared in the same way so that the statistical description of their location is the same in the two cases, then you expect them to have some uh, same macroscopic properties. So how do you actually then, uh, in theory, how do you actually go about calculating those macroscopic properties, thermodynamic properties? <clears throat> and there, the prescription is this, that uh, what you have to do is you have to calculate this J, uh, this Z, this Z is what I have uh, told you here. This Z is a, this Z depends on all the JIJs. And this trace is of course trace over SI. For a given sample, uh, this Hamiltonian has these JIJs. And these JIJs are fixed for a particular sample. So for this fixed set of JIJs, you're supposed to calculate this trace over a size or integrate over a size, whatever, depending on what kind of classical or quantum systems you're looking at. And then the partition function that we'll get itself will depend on the specific JIJs that you have. 
So this is what I have written down here. Then you take the log of that partition function and then take this average over GIGs. And that should give you, the, the claim is that this quantity will give you the free energy for a typical sample where the GIGs are taken from a particular distribution. Okay. Yeah. So can I just think of it like a, a big sample and like different parts of the big yeah, sample yeah, basically? That's, that's what I'm getting at, yeah. <laughs> so I have not written down the uh, reason for saying that this is the right quantity to look at, but this is exactly what uh, Sanjeev just mentioned. So <clears throat> again, you know, just take five minutes to motivate why that's the right quantity to look at. So what you do is you take this uh, big sample. And this is again some, some prescription that is, uh, you must have seen in, uh, in the standard statistical mechanics where you break up the sample into sub samples. So this is my whole big sample, but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up into, let's say, <clears throat> like that. So I'll call this sample one, two, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so the idea is that, you know, this, uh, of course, one is, eventually one is going to look at a thermodynamic limit. So the whole sample size goes to infinity. I divide it into many such subsamples, but each subsample also eventually will go to infinity. <clears throat> but the important thing is that here, you will have a particular realization of the JIGs, which I'll call JIJ1. Here you will have again JIJ. And the point is, uh, the JIGs that we'll have here will not be the same as the JIGs that we'll, we'll have there, but they're taken from the same distribution. So they will be somewhat statistically similar. And similarly, you know, for each of the subsamples, you can say that, you know, there will be some uh, JIJ. And if you have n such subsamples, then each of them will provide a realization of the JIGs. And the other thing is that if you have a large number of such uh, subsystems, averaging over this, all these subsystems is sort of same thing as that average that I've written down over there, averaging over JIGs, because each subsystem provides a realization of the JIGs with a, uh, taken from that uh, distribution. And uh, <coughs> When you average over all of them, then that is sort of equivalent to averaging over the distribution itself. But the quantity that you can average should be such that it, it's additive. That's why, uh, that's why you're doing it for the free energy. So you see, you can ask, why don't we average the partition function itself, right? But the partition function itself is not a self-averaging quantity. The free energy is because the free energy is additive. In the sense that the free energy of this whole system, here you have some, if you just consider this part of the system, then we'll have some free energy system one, we'll have a free energy of system two, et cetera, et cetera. The total free energy will be, will be F1 plus F2 plus F3, et cetera, et cetera, apart from some boundary effects. The total free energy uh, <coughs> will be Apart from some boundary effect, and we are assuming short range interactions, so the boundary effects will generally you know, are, are somewhat uh, you know, smaller power uh, of the size as compared to the bulk effect. So then the idea is that uh, if I want to look at uh, the free energy of the whole system, then you are adding things up. And uh, so additive, additive quantities, that uh, a quantity that for the full system is the sum of the quantities for the subsystem, for that, uh, doing this kind of a blocking, the same thing as doing this kind of an averaging. So that again is in some sense, uh, this is something that uh, is not rigorous uh, in, 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 in the strict sense, but it makes physical sense because what you are doing is you are adding up the uh, free energies of the blocks 
and each block is providing a different realization of uh, the disordered, the JIGs. And so <laughs> averaging over all the blocks is the same as averaging over uh, the distribution of JIGs. Uh, there is one, uh, there is one uh, sort of uh, situation where this doesn't work, is that uh, very close to critical points where uh, the idea that these are all, are all independent, it doesn't work anymore because as I said in a critical point, uh, you have uh, a correlation length, which becomes, uh, which diverges. So the free energies of these individual blocks, it's difficult to prove that they are actually independent of each other. So the system uh, <coughs> is not self-averaging, depends on how the, how the correlation length diverges and things like that. But uh, that's a special point. So, I mean, in general, when uh, I can treat these free energies of these individual blocks as independent, there uh, one can do this kind of a thing. And uh, then uh, uh, the, this, this works for this little f, which is this whole thing divided by n, the free energy per particle that is self averaging. And to uh, <coughs> do that, one has to calculate this quantity. Okay, can we do this averaging even later? Like we can find susceptibility or susceptibility or magnetization and then uh, take an average. Yeah, anything that adds up, anything that you can sort of break up into this uh, sum uh, of that quantity over blocks. <clears throat> but the, uh, the point is, you see, I mean, keeping the JIGs, this becomes completely intractable. That how are we going to, <coughs> if for a particular set of JIGs, if you could calculate the free energy or the susceptibility, et cetera, et cetera, and that's fine. That's what one should do. Experimentally, that's what one is doing. But in theory, it is impossible to do. Because even when all the JIGs are like the same, like, you know, standard Heisenberg model, you cannot solve the problem uh, analytically. And here, uh, this additional complication is that the coupling constants are not all the same. So there is no way of analytically solving this problem, except in one dimension, perhaps. In the higher dimensions, you cannot. <clears throat> Keeping the JIGs as random variables. So the idea is that one should, in some sense, be able to average our average over this changes. Then one gets into Hamiltonian, which is translationally invariant. And then there are some uh, ways. Uh, even that becomes uh, very difficult to solve, as we'll see later on. But there are some standard ways of dealing with uh, Hamiltonians, which don't have any disorder in it. You can do mean field theory. You can do you know, other approximations, or renormalization group, all sorts of things like that. <clears throat> So that is, uh, that is uh, what uh, one is going to do here. Is self-averaging a statement of center limit theorem? In some sense, yeah. But you know, the central limit theorem, I suppose, uh, we look at sort of uh, some kind of an independent, statistical independence is there. If you do the measurement, one measurement affects the other measurement, then you don't have probably. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, here each of these things uh, will have to be, I mean, one would say that these are sort of independent. So that's why, I mean, if you have a long length scales in your problem, then there might be some issues with it. <coughs> but, uh, right, I mean, so if you're, if you're uh, saying that, you know, you're just summing up this, these things and each of them can be taken from a distribution of this, uh, of this F itself. And then if you average over a large number of them, then they will supposed to converge. <clears throat> so yeah, time is more or less up. So I mean, I'm just, I'm just going to explain this a little bit and then we'll start from here, the actual calculation. <clears throat> so this is the average that one is supposed to look at. But the question is, how are you going to calculate this average? Because the partition function uh, for a given set of JIGs uh, is impossible to calculate. So basically, one would like to somehow average over this JIGs. And uh, there, this uh, uh, mathematical identity, this, this Repsica method uh, was introduced to get around this problem. And uh, this is something that you can uh, easily see for yourself. Uh, so 
So uh, when x to the n minus one divided by n, when you take the n going to zero limit, this gives you the log because this is exponential of n times log x. And when the n goes to zero, then you have just <clears throat> log x, uh, n times log x and divided by n, then you get log x. And one is one then makes use of this trick. This log of z that is sitting here is written like that, z to the power n, uh, then average, this average is <coughs> the same as this average over this JHS, this average. <coughs> so we have to calculate this log of z average, and this log of z is written as z to the n minus one divided by n, in the limit n going to zero. And uh, one changes that uh, <coughs> this averaging is done inside. So <coughs> z to the n average, as you can see here, ZJIJ is basically a trace of uh, over the sigmas. Now we have each sigma carries a label alpha, which is the replica label, in the sense that uh, Z to the N is written, being written as <coughs> this quantity. Alpha goes to one, uh, alpha goes from one to N, and H is now a function or depends on this replicated variables and the same JIJs. As you can see here, here, I'm taking a trace over all these replicated variables. So one set of replicated variables, the trace gives you one, one Z. So if you have N set of replicated variables, that will give you Z to the power N. So this going from here to there is uh, very simple that uh, you're just writing the same partition function, but uh, since we need to get the nth power, you're writing it N times, and each partition function will have its own uh, sigma variables. Okay, and then you do a trick that you know uh, this trace you take outside and uh, you do this JIJ average inside. So this uh, trace sigma alpha you take outside and then you, you do this square bracket averaging on this. And uh, when you do the, this averaging, then depending of course on the on the p you know, the probability distribution, you'll get something. And it will not depend on uh, this JHS anymore because you are averaging over this JHS. Right, so uh, this way you will get an effective Hamiltonian which doesn't have any disorder in it anymore. But uh, the complication is that instead of having one set of spin variables sigma i, you have now sigma i alpha. One more index is there. i goes from one to n and alpha goes from one to little n. So we have n set of variables, and uh, this uh, different replica uh, variables get coupled when you do this averaging. So we'll have an effective Hamiltonian written in terms of this replicated spin variables, and uh, this is defined in this particular way that you know you take this exponential of h, then you do the averaging, take the log because you know you have to put that back in the exponent again, and uh, so this this uh, is just a one line of algebra that will take you from here to there. So this is the trick, so to speak, that people used to deal with this uh, quenched disorder, not just for the spin glass problem, this was invented to deal with other disordered problems. And uh, the fact that you, know, you need to take the log of Z for a particular set of JIGs and then average over the JIGs, that is a difficult thing to do. So you basically uh, <coughs> write this log in this funny form and the x to the n or z to the n, you write by introducing n replicas of the system with the same JIJs because you have to take this uh, JIJ for a particular set of JIJs and then take the nth power. So, and each replica basically gives you one power of z. And uh, then uh, <coughs> this trace you take outside and uh, the average you take inside. And that gives you an effective Hamiltonian written in terms of the replicated spin variables, but which is no longer, uh, doesn't have any randomness in it because the JIGs have been averaged over. And then, uh, you know, this age effective sigma uh, uh, that you can treat so, in various uh, ways. Question that's little n is that the limit you have to end into zero limit. Yes. But then you're taking the sum over alpha from one going to little n. Right. So that gives you nth power, no? This each. So, I mean, let me write it down. So, like n, 
could be living. For the time being, I mean, don't worry about the n going to zero limit. That causes a lot of confusion. So don't take this n to be, let's say, some positive integer, right? So I mean, you know, I can always write this z is what I have written here actually. Trace sigma i and I call it one replica. Right, so this is okay, right? I could also write this as trace sigma i two. Oh, you cannot see right. That's actually is a bad thing. And these are dummy variables. What I put one or two or seven, it doesn't matter, right? So if I have now, uh, uh, this is also the same thing as trace sigma i two. It's a tetra, but you will have a sigma i two there. So here, what is happening here is that or this alpha is going from one to n. Alpha equals one is giving you one factor of z, alpha equals two is going to be giving you another factor of z. So if you have n such things, they will have n to the n powers of z. Right? The important thing is that the JIGs are not changing going from here to here. In one case, you are taking the same Hamiltonian, but in one case, you are writing it as a function of this new set of spin variables and taking a trace over that. In other case, you are writing different set of spin variables, again, taking a trace of that, but each trace gives you a factor of z. So if you have n such variables, then you will have, there's a sum here in the exponent. And here you do the average of a j. And uh, then uh, you end up with uh, an effective Hamiltonian, which uh, involves all this sigma i alphas. Alpha now goes from one to n, but it doesn't have any randomness anymore. And so then uh, this effective Hamiltonian, uh, you treat whichever way uh, uh, you wish. I mean, you know, again, treating this itself is not a uh, simple thing. And, uh, and the thing that you know, a lot of people get turned off by this because eventually you have to take this and going to zero limit. So, I mean, all these things are quite kosher when you're looking at n equals five or n equals seven or whatever, but how to analytically continue that to n equals zero that is something that people didn't like. But uh, subsequently, I mean, there has been a lot of research where you don't, one doesn't use this replica method and so on. And one finds that at least in this context, there is no uh, harm done in doing this replica method. <clears throat> okay, so this is uh, something that uh, uh, is probably a reasonable place to stop because uh, then the next thing is that you know we have defined the edwards anderson model so then uh, you use the replica method on that and then treat it in mean field theory or do it in some other way and then see what kind of prediction one gets from that uh, treatment okay any other questions 